Hi, everyone. I'm going to repeat that again because I'm not sure you heard that, that we're just waiting for everyone to sign up to this uh, third GIJN webinar on the pandemic. So if you could uh, just stand by uh, while you wait another minute or so, we're just going to put up a, a, a page with our future webinars uh, that are coming up. Okay, there we go. Great, okay, sorry, we're just, there's a lot of people here and a lot of things happening and a lot of people signing up, but I wanted to say, Thank you, everyone. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, thanks again to those who have been waiting. And it's great to have everyone here for the third uh, Global Investigative Journalism Network webinar uh, on COVID-19. And today we focus on collaborating on long form television investigations and documentaries, uh, which have been very challenging and hard to do at, during this pandemic for other obvious reasons. Uh, my name is Anne Koch, and I'm the program director at GIJN, uh, actually a former BBC uh, World Service commissioning editor. Um, and I'm joined by a, a great group um, of other commissioning editors and others. Um, I'm going to be the moderator today for this, uh, for this webinar. And we've assembled an amazing cast of people. Really, I'm really thrilled. We've got TV news commissioning editors and others from uh, RTS in Switzerland, from um, Premier, Le Le Premier Ligne in France, um, BBC Global News, BBC Arabic, and BBC Africa, uh, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and also uh, the American Public Broadcasting Service Investigation Program Frontline. And we're going to be discussing in-depth television journalism on COVID-19 uh, in the months ahead. Um, so I'll introduce them one at a time in a moment. Uh, just to, uh, for those of you not familiar with GIJN, uh, we're the largest uh, uh, organization in the world of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations. And we have 187 member organizations in 78 countries. But we work with journalists all over the world, whether they're commercial or freelance or nonprofit. Uh, and we're, we were established to connect and support them. So check out our website, gijn.org, and uh, we have newsletters and great resource center and so on. So today we have not two or three, but nine uh, very experienced TV commissioning uh, commissioners, program heads and journalists for the next 90 minutes. Um, they're gonna share their ideas uh, on commissioning for the pandemic and explain what they're looking for and then suggest how to collaborate perhaps if there's time. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is um, with this webinar, uh, we're launching um, a secure and confidential uh, collaborative platform for documentary makers and others to pitch ideas uh, for television programs um, about the pandemic. Uh, I will put the link up if it isn't already up in the, in the chat room and uh, it's also going to be on our website. And, just to let you know that if you submit an idea there, it will, it will be confidential and shared only with the people, the speakers who are involved in this webinar. So um, you can also, during this webinar, of course, you'll have a chance to ask the, um, the commissioners and others here questions directly. Uh, and I'm gonna just go through a few logistics before we start. As I said earlier, it's a 90 minute webinar um, and each speaker is going to be introduced in turn and then we'll speak for approximately five minutes. It's like a, a lightning round. There's, there's nine speakers. Uh, and of course, we want to hear questions uh, from anyone in the audience who would like to ask questions and they can be sent in the chat box in writing. And then my colleague Eunice Ah will repeat your questions to the whole audience. She'll come up on the screen and repeat the questions. If, you're, if you want to direct a, a question at somebody in particular, please say so. If you have a general question, fine, that's also okay. Uh, last point, just to let you know, is we are recording um, this webinar. So just to let you know that. 
and I think we can start. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, um, Jean-Philippe Seppi of Swiss Public Television and the ex executive producer of the investigative television program, Temps Présent. So over to you, Jean-Philippe. Uh, thank you very much. Um, hi to everybody. Um, thanks to the Global uh, Investigative Network uh, a lot. Uh, just a few words maybe about how this whole ID started. Um, all the people around this table I used to um, meet in marketplace, exchange ideas, exchange magazine, formats, contents, and all these things just collapsed and disappeared. The wall marketplace was crumbled a month ago. All the traditional links were cut. Uh, so this idea came that um, we should reconnect all together, especially around investigative ideas. And um, <clears throat> we all know that there are two specifics about the business we are doing. One is that fabricating a magazine, fabricating a documentary takes time. It takes more time than news. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that we address a very special audience. We address an audience which, like, uh, which lacks uh, in-depth, informed, emotional, uh, long-term magazine and documentary stories. As I said, this takes a bit of time and we had to act in a context where news has been dominating and they've been doing an excellent job. We think now it's time that uh, in-depth stories, especially investigative stories, um, um, uh, target this audience, an audience that we, we all know very well. So what do we mean by uh, investigative stories? Of course, this could be immersive stories. Uh, we are specialized in that. Uh, that has to be uh, added value documentaries, added value magazines. Uh, that could be as well diaries, for instance, personal uh, uh, documentaries written in the I person. And uh, of course, something which has been unseen and new. Uh, it can be as well historical content, scientific contents, and uh, of course, everything related to, say, unknown aspects. And of course, we're talking investigative documentaries. What we are looking for, especially regarding my own outlets, the Swiss Broadcasting Television, in French, in German, in Italian, in English, um, it is first in a short range, I would say in a frame of a month, are 26 minutes, 52 minutes formats, inside story, for instance, about how specific government and administration have been dealing with the crisis, how they were warned, they did not react. Uh, we're interested as well about how whistleblowers have been silenced when this happened, where if it is in any country of the world or a global story, we're interested as well of what was the state of the military slash civilian scenarios around a pandemic, how have these scenarios been treated by various administration, government, and so on. And on a longer term, I would say, uh, we, of course, interested in relevant investigative stories, the good and the bad practice uh, during the, crack the, the crisis. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, about the story about masks. Uh, uh, we hear that some countries have, uh, have been counterpricing uh, stocks of masks when other countries have been buying masks. Uh, we're interested as well about the race of vaccines. Uh, communication tactics as well, I think are a relevant investigative stories, how government have been communicating to their people, lying sometimes. Uh, of course, there will be big stories about crooks, uh, people who profit from the crisis. I guess this will happen in any country. There's a big story about uh, money helicopters. A lot of states have distributed money. Uh, all around in my country, for instance, we hear already about stories of people who've been pocketing money without any, uh, any control, any tracking. Uh, that's going to be a uh, big stories as well. The origin of the virus as well is a story, we guess, um, whether it's emanating from a lab, whether it's emanating from pangolin, from the bats, from wherever. And of course, being based here in Geneva, the Swiss television is very interested about stories around the WHO. Uh, as, as all of you guys know, there are now uh, critics towards 
uh, WHO uh, policies attitude and um, that a few stories we we interested in um, on our side uh, and I guess most of my colleagues would say the same we have all kind of financial frames in which we can work whether it's pre-sales sales it's commissioning it's co-production direct production whether it's taking part to certain ideas with other colleagues or the television as long as we are not competitors uh, we are a small outlet a small television switzerland is a small country but we are ready to contribute to ideas and contribute financially to good ideas as long as we agree on an embargo date so we agree on an angle with all the colleagues and uh, we think the best way to enter into contact is with the excellent form which has been drafted by the global investigative network and which is which is online so thank you again for this initiative and i'm sure this is going to be a great start for great ideas and great stories Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a long uh, wish list there, really interesting. And I'm going to turn now to Mary Wilkinson, who's the head of uh, editorial content at the BBC Global News at BBC Glo Global News Limited, the commercial arm of the BBC. Mary, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, <clears throat> let me first explain. Um, Global News Limited, we're actually BBC World News, which is the BBC's English language 24-hour news and current affairs um, channel. And you'll notice actually that um, there's a, a bevy of um, BBC editors on this call. I draw on everything that they do. So I'm in um, quite a lucky position that um, the BBC being as, as large as it is, and, and because we've got a global remit, um, I have lots of colleagues who are producing extremely good journalism that I can benefit from. But that doesn't mean that we um, have everything covered. So what we're looking for is there's, there's a high bar to jump. Um, but um, going through uh, Jean-Philippe's wish list, it's, it's all of that, but it needs to be something that we haven't got access to. So that probably pushes us into the domain of uh, whistleblowers, um, bad actors, people profiting, um, insider testimony, or extremely good access films where somebody has very quickly got off the mark and managed to embed themselves with somebody right at the heart of the story. And God knows whether anybody was with Andrew Cuomo, for instance, at the beginning of this. It's, it's too late now. I don't know if anybody was there. Or with one of the scientific teams, then we would definitely be interested in those sort of stories. So, um, and, yeah, so it's everything from the science, the human impact, the long term economic consequences, but also. Um, who knew what, when, and what did they do about it, and are there lessons that we can learn? Um, we are difficult to collaborate with because we broadcast around the world. Um, so that means that working with a national broadcaster is um, means that the national broadcaster would normally want to go first, and we take a, a second window when it comes to um, the worldwide rights um, but we will pay a smaller price accordingly um, for that but working with the BBC is frequently um, quite a, a neat way of doing it because we've obviously got um, the UK part of the BBC plus the whole of the world service so we broadcast in Arabic in Persian and then worldwide in, in English so sometimes uh, a BBC solution and me commissioning something in collaboration with my BBC colleagues, both in radio and television, because um, generally um, anything that's a good enough story, we would do it actually in three platforms, digital, television and radio. That's about it. Great. Thank you, Mary. Just a quick question. Is there a, a, an appetite across the BBC? And then I'll, I'll turn to Chris, Christopher Mitchell from BBC Arabic, but is there an appetite where you, from where you're sitting to do extensive amount of real follow-up in-depth stuff on 
COVID, uh, the pandemic in the next period, 18 months or longer even? Is it a, a huge yeah, priority? I mean, it, it, it's obviously a seismic event. Um, and certainly at the moment, it sort of seems like it's the only story in town. I'm sure, you know, maybe even six weeks from now, that might begin to feel slightly overblown or it might not. Um, and we're definitely doing lots of long-term thinking about what is it that we should be doing to both track the story in real time, but also deliver something that has um, enormous impact several months out from, from now. And again, the nature of our coverage, because we're a mixture of news and documentaries, we can actually do both. So something that um, is observational, that is giving you little narrative peaks every so often as something that you can carry within your news coverage, um, but you can also build up to a really good, revealing, um, impactful documentary several months from now. So we're, we're flexible. Okay, thank you very much, Mary. That, thanks a lot. And Chris, Christopher Mitchell, who is the editor of television documentaries for BBC Arabic. Uh, good to hear from you. Hi, um, and thank you for inviting me. And thanks also to GIGN for um, hosting, this, hosting this event, which could not feel more timely. Um, yeah, I think much of what I would say has probably already been uh, been said by Jean-Philippe and Mary, and I, I suspect most of us are going to end up saying fairly similar things, which is that we're looking for strong, original, informative journalism um, about uh, what is going on with COVID around ar around the world. It's in, in many ways it's fairly uh, it's fairly obvious. Um, BBC Arabic, as the name suggests, broadcasts in Arabic to about 45 million people in the Middle East and North Africa every week. Um, our, our, as we, our, our English, uh, our films go out in, uh, in English as well on Mary's network, BBC World News, but our primary audience is, is Arabic. Um, ordinarily, we cover the Middle East um, more or less exclusively. We would not be interested in the rest of the world, but in the case of coronavirus, we will take right now, we would take anything that meets our editorial standards, um, or we're much, much more open minded about the, uh, the geographical areas that we cover. So my colleague, um, Adam Grimley, who's going to speak in a moment, um, recently uh, produced uh, a very, very strong film on uh, Wuhan under lockdown. Ordinarily, we would not show a film about China, but we were delighted to show this film a couple of weeks ago, and it did really, really well for us. And I think it's uh, the measure of, of that success. It shows just what thirst there is at the moment for any in-depth coverage uh, that shows what people are going through. And clearly China, as having been the first country to um, undergo uh, the horrors of, of corona and the lockdown, um, uh, was a subject of immense interest to our audience. So right now, we're unusually wide in our interests, and we would take uh, we would be open to pretty much um, any strong film that we feel is going to inform the Arabic speaking audience about the virus and its consequences. Um, our slot lengths are uh, 30 and 60 minutes in running time. That's, that means 25 and 52. Um, and we also have a digital network and so we're open to shorter uh, durations as well. So if somebody has a story of six, eight, 12, 15 minutes, that's something that could also work for us. Longer term, um, I'd also pick up on what Mary and Jean-Philippe have been saying. We'd be interested in deeper investigations into the impact of corona, um, specifically on the Arab world, but again, not only, not only that. Um, we're interested in uh, the responses of, uh, of government, the management and the manipulation of information, um, the way perhaps that the, uh, the crisis is being used as a smokescreen for other activities to be taking place by governments and other actors. We're interested in getting under the skin of what's going on in the countries in our region and also elsewhere. Um, in terms of the way that we operate, um, we, as a rule, we're open to pitches from uh, contributors from outside the BBC. Um, we work with freelance filmmakers. We also work with independent production companies. And we are also very open to working with other networks um, whom we feel uh, we have an editorial fit with. So we're very, very interested to hear from people who have strong ideas, um, very interested in obviously in access, 
um, interested in um, user-generated content. That's something that, uh, that we particularly welcome and which I feel is going to be especially relevant in dealing with this crisis, particularly in parts of the world such as the Middle East where access is uh, can be difficult at the best of times. So we're very, very keen to hear from people who are already filming or are in a position to film in those parts of the world. So that's, uh, that, that's a brief outline of, of, of what we'd like to see. That sounds extremely interesting. I mean, you did re reiterate some of the points made before, but also added a substantial number of new ones. Mm -hmm. And that will, by the way, just for everyone listening, we'll be reporting back on this webinar. And a lot of these ideas will be put up on our website, or at least, sorry, not ideas, but rather the, the points that the people like Chris and Mary and others are, have been making. So you'll see them all there. Chris, that's great. Thanks very much. Just one last question for, for you is, do you have, how many slots do you have available? I mean, are you, well, is your, is your scheduling quite flexible as well at the moment or? It's more flexible than it usually is. We have, um, we have two documentary slots a week, one of which is uh, specifically original commissions in the Middle East. Uh, not every slot, not every uh, uh, show in that slot is, uh, is an original commissions. We do, we do some acquisitions too. Um, but I wouldn't regard that as uh, particularly dictating the nature of what we do at the moment. These are exceptional times. Um, we need to respond to the audience as immediately and as strongly as we can. And so um, if, if somebody brought me a great completed film on uh, Corona now, I would try to schedule it you know, as soon as I possibly could. So everything is up for grabs right now. Good, thanks very much. And um, Mark Perkins, uh, the investigations editor, BBC Africa. Uh, is it also the case that you're, you have become more global in the way that uh, Chris just described? Uh, I, Not how, quite how, the same what, way. What are you looking for? Not quite the same way. So, so um, I edit a program called Africa Eye, um, which is uh, 20 investigative films a year. Um, they're a combination of half hours and one hour programs. Um, where our focus is definitely, it's, so we, we broadcast um, in four languages, House of French, Swahili and English. Um, and they, it goes out to local partners across the continent. So it's 30, around 30 uh, local partners, as well as putting content out through Mary's um, uh, World News uh, and also, you know, our, our, we're, we're looking exclusively at producing content for an African uh, audience, for a sub Saharan would you, African would, audience. So, yeah. Mark, would you mind repeating that? You just slightly faded there, uh, or we had a bit of technical problem there. Could you just repeat what you said? Pardon me. Sorry, so, um, so Africa Eyes 20, 20 investigative programs a year. Um, it's exclusively for an African audience. So it'll be broadcast in four languages, House of French, Swahili, and English. And most, and our content all goes out through local partners. There's 30 partners, um, uh, local TV partners across uh, Africa, across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in addition to that, we put content out through Mary's um, World News, and also there's a big digital push through YouTube and, and other social platforms. Um, and so we've got a combination of half hours and one hours. Um, uh, it is for an African audience, so we will take, we will look at, for instance, uh, connections between Africa and the world. So if there's supply problems for PPE coming in from uh, somewhere into, into Africa, that, that would be of interest to us. Uh, and we collaborate sometimes with uh, Arabic, et cetera, if there's stuff that, that fits both of our audiences. But I'm slightly less global than, uh, than Chris. Mm -hmm. We are really making content for an African, uh, for an African audience only um, and about them. Uh, so we've got at the moment, uh, when it comes to Corona, we've got four investigations which are ongoing um, uh, across different parts of the continent. Um, they are in they're in production, but they're like everything, like all of us, we're working this out bit by bit about how we deploy carefully and how do we manage that. Um, I'm not saying all going to work, uh, but um, there's four currently in production, and we're very open. We have a big we have a, already have a, a big network of freelancers uh, across the continent who we work with. Uh, regularly and they're, they're feeding us ideas as we speak you know regularly um, and we're working our way through those ideas and we would we, we collaborate generally with anybody who gets in touch with us uh, and we work with inside the BBC but also mostly with those freelance investigative um, uh, journalists in Africa um, as we do co-press and some commissioning as well but generally uh, the general model is that you know we have uh, local journalists who write into us and then we work to basically build a team around them to go and produce the story. Um, and, and we are, of course, looking for, and it hasn't quite, it's hit Africa, of course, but it's not quite, it's not the same way as Europe. So we are looking now to, we are now currently gearing up to see what we can deliver for the audience. Okay. Can you say any more about the four that you're, you have in production or? 
they're, 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 they're pretty standard, I would say. They're, they're going after rock. So, you know, it's an investigative program. So we're looking for wrongdoing and we're looking trying to hold power to account. So we're looking at people um, profiting off selling of PPE. We're looking at uh, quacks and various other people who are putting out to profiting somehow by putting out false information. So it's a pretty standard stuff. I would look, you know, it's a sort of a knee jerk reaction. And those are, they touch wood, those seem to be working at the moment. We're producing those. But I'm also looking at the medium, medium, long term. So, what are the economic effects? How, you know, how Africans going to survive a couple of months of lockdowns or whatever's going to happen next? So, we're looking at tangential stuff as well across Corona, because of course it's it's going to it's had an effect across all society. So, you know, short run we did a sort of knee jerk reaction and looked at immediate wrongdoing, and long term we're looking at how, like Chris and like Jean Philippe, we're looking at how governments are going to react to this, um, how how, uh, and so that's a sort of longer term plan, and that I haven't we haven't even started yet. Yeah, it's uh, you've got quite a lot going on already. Thanks for that. That's uh, really interesting. Adam Grimley now, I think we will turn to you as the last BBC contributor for now, who Adam being the editor of Our World um, and part of BBC TV Current Affairs. You can probably explain it better to the audience than I can, Adam. So go ahead. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I can. Um, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for hosting this. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure to hear um, so many um, uh, sort of thoughtful filmmakers um, online uh, in what's been a rather lonely um, existence uh, for, for the last few weeks. Um, so I edit a strand called Our World. I'm the executive producer of a strand called Our World. Um, that's 30, 23 minute films a year. Um, uh, so they go out on BBC World News, so I work closely with Mary, um, and also on the BBC News channel. Uh, in the UK. Um, I work with two of the people you've just heard from, um, with Christopher Mitchell and with Mark Perkins. So we often collaborate with, with uh, journalists within the BBC, um, but we also take films from freelance filmmakers, freelance reporters. Uh, we work sometimes with independent companies, independent production companies uh, in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and we sometimes collaborate with other broadcasters uh, in Australia, for instance. Uh, we've got a project uh, ongoing at the moment. Um, so I have a very broad remit. Um, I'm looking for um, uh, powerful human stories from around the world. Um, as as um, Chris kindly said, I've, I've already done a film out of uh, Wuhan, which was acquiring rushes shot by filmmakers in the city under the lockdown. Um, and like many of you, we're having to be a bit more nimble about the way that we work, um, which is both how we edit the programs, um, physically how we edit them, uh, but also how we work with um, producers and reporters in the field. And there's a couple of people have already mentioned in particular at the moment, UGC. So that's one model that we're finding working for us, but I'm keen to find others. Um, I take some investigations, so in that 30, um, uh, I take a mix. I take some investigations, I take some powerful observational films, um, I take some reporter-led, it's a real mix. Um, so I'm totally open to ideas, and in many ways I think this situation is a, um, as much as it's a good time for, for anything right now, it is a good time to experiment, and it's a good time to try and do things differently and, and um, break the mold of what we do. Um, well, I, have, I have several films ongoing at the moment. Um, I've got one with healthcare workers in New York. I've got one which is UGC from workers in Spain who've been sort of keeping the country going, keeping the country ticking over um, while Spain's been going through the crisis. Um, so I've got several in production now, but I'm looking for more. Um, like many of you, I'm looking, trying to look ahead a bit as much as it's possible with a story that's moving at such pace. So the economic impacts of it, I think Mark mentioned, is something I would be interested in. That's a really hard thing to get at. But if you look at the scale of what the IMF talked about yesterday or the um, Office, Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK, the scale of that economic hit is going to be something we're living with for decades. How do we tell stories about that? How do we unpack that? How do we put a human face on something which is, um, uh, you know, where the numbers are so huge, it risks becoming impersonal. Um, what about parts of the world with less developed healthcare? 
Um, how is it going to affect them? How are they going to cope? Is the rest of the world going to be able to, 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 to help share their burden and so on? So I'm very open to ideas. I don't have, um, like many of you, I don't have huge pots of money. Um, but what I do have is an ability to move fast and to be nimble and to commission quickly if I see an idea I really like. As Mary said, there is a, our films go out on world news, so there is a um, rights issue we have to look at. But um, I'm very open to ideas and, um, you know, it would be lovely to collaborate with, with some of you as the weeks and months go on. And I'm very glad that this, um, you know, this forum's up and running. Great. Thanks very much for that. Very helpful. I think it's um, interesting that this has thrown up the kind of common view. I think that people need to do things a bit differently, collaborate a bit more, innovate a bit more with, uh, you know, the kind of stuff you're running. And I think that's uh, really interesting. And maybe we'll see some good ideas come forward after this, this session, I hope. Um, so I would like to turn now, please, to Claudine Blay, who is the editor-in-chief of Enquête uh, for Radio-Canada, part of the CBC in Canada. Uh, and welcome, Claudine. You're going to have to unmute yourself before you can speak. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Go uh, ahead. Yes. So I'm editor-in-chief of a program called Enquête and another one called La Facture, uh, which is more interesting in consumer stories. But uh, I'm talking here mostly from Enquête. Uh, uh, we prepare, <clears throat> and, and I work very closely with CBC, uh, Marie Callos, that I think not here this morning, but uh, we work very closely with the CBC English part. So um, I'll transmit the messages if there's some with Marie, no problem. Um, so we prepare stories for next fall because um, <clears throat> our program had stopped for the moment. But on public health decision, of course, um, how they were taken in Canada and we'll look at too, um, the, 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 the history of, of all those public health decisions. Um, we are uh, also following economic decisions in Canada. Um, and in other countries and uh, see the impact of all this public money going to private companies for the moment for help and probably recession and austerity that will follow that. And the same people that were on finance, hospitals and all those institutions, um, how, what's the future for, for, for the economy, okay? So we, we, have, we follow stories actually on this. Um, we're also interested in stories about the wet market, uh, the wet markets around the world, the, the, the zoo noses, and how we can maybe as investigative journalists uh, in each country. Uh-oh, um, let's see if this, this, let's see if Zoom writes itself. Uh, I don't know, Marie, if you can hear. Uh, uh, sorry, Claudine, if you can hear. But um, I think maybe we need, we'll move on and then, ah, you're back. Did you, you know that we lost the last part of what you said. Did you, could you see that you froze? So we got okay. to the point where you were talking about your interest in, uh, in stories on wet markets. So could you start from yes. that point again? Thanks. Sorry. The Zoom is okay, so very I, well. I, uh, but I think there's an interest to follow that uh, around the world, you know, the wet markets, the, the trafficking of animals and uh, how it's handled by countries, different countries, and uh, how this traffic will, will it still be going on and the impact of this. So I think there's a story to follow there. Uh, I think the the COVID reveal um, important things about companies. Uh, we read things about Amazon right now. You know, it starts to 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 come out. Um, maybe we can you know follow companies, big ones around the world, big, um, and see uh, how they they deal with COVID. Then it will reveal 
things about companies, very important. Um, and of course, we're interested in the in the, the classic follow the money, but I think it will be very important after the uh, now and after, you know, uh, who will take advantage of all this and uh, who are the winners and who are the losers and um, uh, any angles on this is uh, of big interest for us. That's it mostly. Great. Sounds very uh, good. I mean, a lot of the ideas that you're suggesting uh, have to do with global things yeah. that involve global collaboration. Yes. I mean, if, if you're going to track uh, global companies, activities, yes. or even following the money stuff, it's, uh, yeah, so there's probably a lot of potential here for yes. projects that collaborate across borders. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll turn now to Luc Hermann, who's the Executive Director of Premier Ligne Television in France. Luc, welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Jean-Philippe in um, Geneva. So we're talking from Paris. I say we because um, I work with Edouard Perrin, who will be the next speaker. I want to also thank you because we're not um, we're not a broadcaster. We're not commissioning editors. We're an independent production company. The reason why we accepted on the spot when you 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 asked us to participate last week is that we were really used to global investigative um, collaborations, and that is the key. It's the key of your uh, great organization organization is that we alone in our countries will never be able to be as strong as we can all be um, uh, producing um, uh, very long and ambitious uh, documentaries all together. So Première Ligne is a small independent production company based in Paris. I was formerly with Canal Plus. Uh, we have a team of about 50 people, uh, production, uh, but mainly investigative reporters, financial reporters, and uh, we work mainly for uh, public networks in Europe, mainly for France Television mainly for Arte. Uh, we've collaborated uh, six, seven times with the BBC Panorama. Uh, we've just finished a series for Netflix. Um, all this to tell you that uh, I believe 129 people are participating today. We would love to be um, a key entry from France to um, collaborate with the key um, people and investigators, just as we've done with the ICIJ. Edouard Perrin will be speaking next. I mean, we've, we've worked on the, uh, the Edouard is the one who launched the LuxLeaks stories even before the ICIJ and us alone in Paris, of course, would have never done uh, as much as was done later on with the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, the uh, Implement Flies and all those stories that we've covered from France, uh, working with um, a lot of different journalists. So yes, I do run a private independent company and uh, I am not using any of the, 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 the stories that uh, will be uh, uh, sent from the <laughs> from the participants just as a business point of view we'd love to be your key point in paris to uh, to to work with uh, independent reporters freelance reporters co-produce with other production companies and also keep in mind that if you're a broadcaster we can also be um, a part of a long uh, team of investigation one quick idea uh, that we're working on that has not been um, addressed so far um, uh, jean philippe you were talking about the um, the, uh, the, uh, the the vaccines and and everything um, I am myself uh, just finishing a, a year-long investigation for Arte um, uh, on big pharma, on the big uh, pharmaceutical companies. And uh, our story will be, it's a 90-minute documentary that will be finished and completed in two weeks. And we're adding a segment on an amazing story that you have probably seen in the U.S. It's one of the big farmers. It's called Gilead Sciences. They were under a lot of spotlight for, during the hepatitis C um, uh, story. They were, they, they, they had, they still have um, an amazing uh, treatment, which is outrageously expensive. And you might have seen that they wanted uh, 10 days ago, they wanted to get a patent for rare disease status. For the ones who have not heard about this story, look it up. The Intercept has worked a lot on this. Médecins Sans Frontières, Médecins du Monde, Oxfam in the UK also. So Gilead Science was backed up. But yes, they had applied with the FDA on a specific and special status. I believe PBS is also so I'm um, looking at this story. It's an amazing story currently going on in the US. So, and the last thing that um, Claudine is a very, very good idea that Claudine just mentioned. We have started also looking at Amazon in France. They were under a lot of spotlight from trade unions who were saying that the people who were 
basically forced to work, I guess. I mean, people who were working in, the, in all their big operating centers definitely did not have the proper masks, the proper distances, social distances between the different workforce, and they did go and went public with video shot uh, within uh, Amazon uh, major um, uh, centers in, in France. So there's a very uh, interesting idea on, uh, on uh, collaborating on major multinational companies like Amazon operating from the entire world with specific different stories. I mean, it's, it, 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 I'm pretty sure that the stories are different uh, from, 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 uh, from the different countries. Thank you so much. Great, thanks very much. That's good to get uh, different perspectives here. Um, also from someone actually running a company trying to do this stuff and also you have a good foot in France. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn to your colleague, Edouard Perrin, who also has a slightly different perspective on this, but I think very useful for this discussion. But before I go to you, Edward, uh, I just want to invite the audience uh, to ask more questions if you wish. Uh, we're, this isn't a commissioning meeting per se, but you may have questions about what kind of a bit more detail on what kind of things people are looking at, or you may actually have some ideas you want to put out there to everyone. So uh, do ask your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Okay, Edward, over to you, please. Hi, nice, uh, nice to talk here. Uh, since I am the second to last to, to intervene, uh, uh, much has been said already, so I, I, will, uh, I will keep it really short. Uh, uh, three things uh, I'd like to point out. Um, mostly on the uh, medium to long term uh, uh, issue first, uh, the helicopter money that was mentioned earlier, the follow the money uh, uh, ID is definitely something that we should uh, be starting to work on. Uh, uh, a lot of money uh, is going to be uh, uh, devoted to uh, the uh, cratering economies all over the world and, uh, and, uh, and we should be collaborating starting to collaborate now to look at how the money is, uh, is uh, being really uh, um, uh, invested and, uh, and who's getting it. And that means uh, looking at the behaviors of uh, economic actors. Uh, uh, do, they, uh, do they give dividends, for instance? Do they uh, use the money to uh, buy back uh, shares? Uh, all these kind of behaviors are going to, to tell a lot on the recovery or not of, uh, of uh, economies around the world. That's uh, one thing. Um, the second thing I'd like to, to, to work on as a, a reporter with others is the, uh, um, all that is related to the Chinese aspects of the, the, the story, uh, not only the origins, but uh, and when I'm talking about origins, uh, the wild market story is a great story because for me it's a corruption story uh, in itself because uh, uh, as far as I understand, those markets should be already uh, banned in China. They were operating, so that means some local uh, officials were taking some bribes to have them uh, running or somehow. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's a story. Uh, there's uh, um, also lead to that I'd like to to to, to see following is uh, the role of censorship over there, and uh, uh, third the um, uh, soft power or propaganda offensive that the Chinese regime has been uh, already started running and how is this going to develop in the coming months is going to be uh, to be really interesting especially in uh, in in Africa for instance how are they going to uh, to uh, balance this with the uh, debts uh, of uh, the the countries and the third item of uh, of uh, interest is and that's also something that could be at the part of a collaboration is uh, how our societies are going to be uh, um, uh, uh, threatened by uh, a huge uh, uh, new era of surveillance in uh, uh, in terms of uh, where we go and how we behave, uh, because that will be uh, the uh, the condition to uh, going back to normal. So three ideas up in the air, but uh, that's uh, that are some somehow uh, uh, worth looking at in the coming month. Thank you very much. That's a, a challenge, I guess, to everyone who might submit an idea. There's, again, three more ideas that you could feed into. Just a question for you, Edward, before we um, move on to Sarah, um, which is, are, there, are you aware of any kind of collaborations being set up at the level of reporters and so on yet, investigative reporters? Are there uh, collaborations already starting? Not yet. I mean, okay. no. 
Yeah. So anyone listening, and uh, if you hear, if you know of any of those, um, by all means, share that as well. Any existing collaborations? Uh, it's it's going to take a little while to get going, I would have thought, but yeah, I think that would be good to hear. Okay, thanks, Edward. That's great. And uh, Sarah Chil Childress, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you're senior editor at Frontline PBS in the U.S. Uh, and uh, from what you said before, uh, about to launch your first uh, COVID-related film on Tuesday. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so. Um, so yes, we have um, already commissioned, obviously, um, you know, when the, when the pandemic began, started thinking right away about what we could do in the immediate, in the immediate term to cover um, this crisis, but obviously there's going to be a long tail here. Um, so I can talk a little bit about what we are looking for and, and who we are. Um, so Frontline is the sort of flagship investigative documentary series for public media in the U.S. Um, so we produce long form documentaries of uh, 50 minutes, sometimes longer, sometimes we go up to two hours, but that's that's rare. Um, we also do shorter pieces, um, magazines anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and we're open to, um, we're always open to, to new ideas and pitches um, and stories in all stages of de development, including co-productions. Um, we regularly collaborate with other media outlets um, or production companies, including our colleagues here at the BBC um, and others. Um, so we're always interested in, in new ideas. Um, I think, you know, the kind of stories we're looking for very much along the lines of what um, you know, my colleagues here have already said. Good stories, obviously something fresh, something revelatory. Um, obviously, since we're in the U.S., um, you know, we're very interested in particular in the U.S. role um, and what's happening here. Um, but we're also interested in stories globally. We tell a lot of stories about what's happening elsewhere um, that can tell us something new about this pandemic, uh, what's being done to to stop it, uh, the fallout. Um, and, um, you know, like I said before, obviously the long tail of this is going to be, I mean, it's really hard even to sort of comprehend, you know, even the films that we have in development now on other topics, you know, we're having to revisit them and re-examine them through the lens of the pandemic, um, you know, our upcoming election, what that's going to look like, um, and so on. So, um, you know, I think um, in some ways, for the next year or so every story in some way is a COVID story because you know so much is going to be impacted um as many many people have already said you know the economy the impact on privacy and politics um so um so you know we're interested in in those ideas obviously since our films take um you know anywhere from six to nine months to produce you know we have to be thinking um ahead what's going to be interesting and relevant and fresh about this story um you know it's we're less interested in a breaking news piece and more interested in going a little bit deeper stepping back a bit to tell something um to examine something from a new angle um to go a little deeper um getting some unique access um um, someone mentioned user-generated content. That's something that we're interested in. Um, we've been um, already starting to experiment with different ways of telling stories, um, and that's something that we're, we're interested in continuing to do. Yeah. Right, that's really um, interesting. Someone just asked a question, um, if you take any, ever take shorter films, um, you know, like I guess you would put together two or three or four, whatever it would be, in one uh, format. Yes, we have done, we do sometimes do, um, we call magazines, so we'll do usually not more than two pieces in an hour, um, mm -hmm. that's a lot, um, you know, in terms of messaging that to our audience, it can become more complicated, so usually we'll, we'll do two pieces in an hour, so one is perhaps 30 minutes and the other is 20, uh, something like that, depending on the length that they need um, to flesh out the story, so we do accept those, yes. Great, and great that you're starting already on Tuesday with something, so we look forward to that. Um, does anybody, um, before I turn to audience questions and to my colleague Eunice, does anyone on the panel, the speakers, have any burning questions or comments they wish to make um, to each other or to, to all in general, the audience? Um, yeah, anybody want to uh, jump in here before I open it up? I don't see any takers. So let's start, Eunice, um, uh, with a few questions or comments. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I've grouped together three questions to ask first. I think the first one is probably more for GIJN uh, from Hamza Aslan. Would you 
please inform us about the best way to reach each of the respected commissioners in the webinar to pitch a story? And the second question, the timeline seems pretty dire. Uh, are the editors looking for long form that can do quick turnaround or are we looking at projects that will definitely take time and might not see a production date till late May? In the States, a lot of our freedom of information departments are working at glacial speeds, which might push the timeline back. And the third question from Rowan, should freelancers in print journalism with a great story with strong visual potential, but without personal broadcast experience, get in touch to see whether the networks can match them with a crew? Good questions. Excellent. Um, on the first one, it is a sort of GIJN question because um, that's why we set up the platform. So if somebody has an idea, you can always state that you would like it directed at someone in particular. Um, but actually, the way we've set up the platform to share ideas is that the people that are on this panel will all be able to have a look. Uh, so rather than um, give out individual contacts, that's probably the best way to start. And then we'll see how that works. It's all an experiment. Um, and then we can try, adjust it if we need to. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to start. Yeah. If anyone has anything, any other ideas on this, by, by all means, jump in. On the question, though, I'll move on for a moment of, of the timeline and when you would be commissioning for. I mean, this is really a question for people commissioning. Um, let's maybe start with, uh, should we start with um, Jean-Philippe? Uh, what, what kind of timeline? I mean, some people have made that clear already, but um, maybe we just reiterate again. Uh, Jean-Philippe, what sort of, when are you looking for? What kind of date? Well, I think we have to, as it was mentioned, I think we have to work on both rhythm. There are short-term stories, like we mentioned the masks issues. For instance, when we hear that the US was ready to overprice uh, a full cargo of masks from China um, to derail a uh, cargo uh, who was ordered by France, I guess this is a, this is a short story which could mm. be developed into a 26-minute story. And <clears throat> as my colleague from from the BBC, we are ready to commission quite quickly. We don't have a lot of money as well, but I guess this is the kind of stories, if I had 26 minutes ready by say uh, three weeks, I would certainly find a slot and find the money to, to broadcast. And then I think a key value we have to have um, is, um, as I think Sarah said, is we have to anticipate. And that's true that we have to project ourselves towards stories in Christmas, for instance, or already in September, especially the economic stories. We have to work on a long term and the news people are doing very good things on the short term and on the long term, I think we have to have this, this, this uh, six to nine month projection to have in-depth stories. So yeah, just to sum up, I think we should be ready as commissioners to work on both with them. Uh, also, another thing I wanted to mention, um, like Luke mentioned, he, he can redirect projects towards French television or Arte. In my case, for instance, I'm representing uh, the Swiss television, but I can redirect towards the correct slots. We have a documentary unit who is mm -hmm. not here at the moment, but if I see a project, which is a long-term project, I, I can completely connect it to our documentary um, people. So I think this is just a starting point here and there would be space for any good ideas. Yeah, I think most people would agree there's a short and long term. I, I mean, I think Claudine Lay said that uh, her own slot, um, or at least one of the two she spoke of starts again in September, but actually CBC more broadly will have shorter term uh, slots as well. So uh, unless anyone begs to differ, I think we can agree that we are telling our audience listening today and others that we have uh, there is interest from for both the short term and the longer term and in a, in a range of documentary or long form lengths, um, everything from 20 minutes up as far as long as two hours occasionally even we heard here. Um, I think that 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 kind of sums it up. If anyone wants to add that some um, please go ahead and do so. Um, there is a third question in this group of questions about freelancers not having broadcasting experience. I mean, maybe someone like Chris, you might want Chris, Chris Mitchell from BBC Arabic, maybe you want to 
take that one. Um, and others, please think about what, what your response would be. People who have effectively a really good story, but they don't have um, a camera and they don't really know how to make films. Yeah. Um, this isn't an issue that only arises in the present context of uh, coronavirus. I mean, we this happens to us quite a lot, that we get contacted by um, newspaper journalists, and in fact others as well, who have particularly strong stories. Um, I welcome that. Uh, I'm very, very open to uh, people bringing us a good story. A good story is a good story. Having said that, not every good story is a television story. Um, some stories that print journalists bring us um, are actually print stories um, or possibly radio stories. They're not always films. Um, and I would always uh, advise any print journalist who is thinking of approaching us that they should, they should ask themselves, first of all, why is this a film? Why is it a film and why is it not um, a newspaper article or a radio program? Is it, does it have something which is specifically visual, which can only work or can work only at its best in filmic form? Um, if they're then convinced that it is right as a film, then um, I would absolutely uh, uh, welcome um, any sorts of submissions of strong stories along those lines. Um, we do this, as I said, we do this quite a lot already, um, and um, it, it usually works pretty well. The same might also be true at the BBC, I would have thought, um, and maybe others, uh, probably CBC actually as well, for radio, if somebody has an idea you just divert them to possibly to someone else who can judge whether or not it would be a good radio program or whether it could be both television and radio. Do you, is that also sometimes what you do, Chris? That you, you would, sorry, caught you by surprise. Well, the, 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 the radio uh, issue came up, I saw out of the corner of my eye in the questions as well. Yeah. Um, and I of mean, course, radio I, commissions. Yeah, yeah it's, um, if a story came up that I felt was a really good story but wasn't quite a film and had radio potential, I would certainly redirect it. Yeah. Um, just on the grounds that one should always try to get good stories out there. And if people bring them to the BBC because we're such a huge audience uh, organization with so many different platforms, um, we can usually find a way of, of getting a strong story produced. Okay, thanks add, for that. Uh, sorry, Ian. Go ahead, Sarah. I was just going to um, add that that's something that we do at Frontline as well. Um, we often partner with um, print outlets, the New York Times, the Washington Post, ProPublica, when they have a good story. Um, and again, the only the only question is sort of whether it's visual. So you know, we'll often ask like, great story, but what can you see, right? What would we be able to see if we were to tell that story? It's yeah. the same question that that Chris asks, but mm -hmm. um, but it's something that we do frequently, and we're always interested in in hearing good stories from those mm -hmm. folks. Having sure, said that, we can also run something as an online piece as well. You know, it can be a print piece that we that we put on the website. It, do, it doesn't always have to be um, a BBC film. Uh, uh, as I was saying, you know, we're fortunate in having so many outlets within the organization that we can accommodate a wide range of forms. Great. And that would be true also of you, Mark. You work, um, Mark Perkins, you work with journalists who are not filmmakers who come to you with stories, um, I guess, as well. Yeah, we're, we're very happy to do that. I mean, that's, we do that regularly. And um, it's, as, as Ed Well said here, it's the quality of the story and the quality of the access that matters to us. Um, you know, and we will work to put, to put a team around that person or that group of people who brought the story together. So that's, that's our bread and butter. And we're very happy to do that print. Doesn't really matter, doesn't really matter. It's the quality of the story and the quality of the access. Good, I think we got a pretty comprehensive answer to that question. Thank you all very much for that. Let's move back to Eunice for another round of questions. Are yes, uh, I've grouped together some of the logistical questions from Sarah Passino. She's asking, because of the current lockdown situation, uh, are you open to Skype Zoom interviews or would you rather have traditional face-to-face -face filming footage? From Victor Seanfield, he's asking about budget levels and also policies regarding risky filming until in productions. And last, Sorry, can you say that again, Eunice? What was that? He, risky filmmaking? Say that again. Yeah. Risky filming until in productions. Ah, okay, sure. Yes, and the last one, Chidera Rose Camel asks, would you accept documentaries worked on with a mobile device? What quality will you accept? User-generated content, mobile phone? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Some, um, yeah, good questions again. Um, so how many people here have views about taking uh, material that has got Skype and Zoom interviews in it? Luke, do you want to? Take that one, thanks. Yes, Luke. Very briefly, uh, uh, you, you've 
probably seen on all your newscasts, not probably, you've seen on all your newscasts that <laughs> Skype or the other um, uh, te uh, technology works pretty well and, and one out of two uh, people speaking on, the, on all the, the old news networks and all the network news also um, use this technique and it's quite efficient. We believe at this time, we have uh, one, five documentaries under production that uh, this will not suit, of course, our, the, the, the demand of the networks and the, and the quality of, of, of a good documentary. I believe it's still possible but what we've done so far um, is that we've asked people to film themselves with a camera that they would have or with a phone that they would have and we would control the, the, the sound and the, and the video and get the video a bit later afterwards. But we've also launched in the US at this time, in Geneva and in, also in London, I have partnered with uh, freelance cameramen. Uh, the interviews are being conducted by our reporters based here in Paris, but unfortunately all of us here, we do have, have we have, unfortunately have no idea when uh, next we will all be in the same room in the same country. Um, I believe, Sarah, you're based in, in Boston, I, I believe. Um, how many months is it going to be before you could travel to Paris and we can send a crew directly to Boston? So my uh, advice, and we've talked about this with many freelancers here in Paris, is at this time is to coordinate. It's not the best, but it's yet to, to try to coordinate with a local cameraman to film for you. Make the interviews via Skype, make the interviews via telephone, but at least you have good pictures and good standard quality pictures for documentaries. And let you, me you see the great, great possibility also. Let me ask you a, a question that followed that, and then we'll go back to the Skype issue and the, the quality of Zoom pictures and so on. But it leads to the second question asked by somebody else, actually, Victor Schoenfeld, I believe, um, on the policy risks here um, to do with this kind of filmmaking, um, because obviously there's a cameraman there and so on. So it would be good to hear from the big organizations as well, but uh, on their, their policies on this, this is a question that has been asked. Uh, but in your case, what would be your, uh, your, the, your company's policy on this kind of filming? Very briefly, uh, uh, I, um, I'm, I'm just about to interview uh, a, a spokesperson from, uh, from a big pharmaceutical company in Paris tomorrow afternoon. And what we have said is that first, our cameramen work on the, on the um, um, voluntary uh, basis. Um, um, we do not use uh, public transportation. We use um, cars and we've rented some cars. Uh, we use masks and we do social distance with the people that we're going to interview. We do not put um, a wireless microphone uh, uh, on, on their jackets. We use the boom microphones on the, on a, uh, on the tripod. And we would, if, if the, this interview happens tomorrow, that I will conduct as we will set up the, the interview in a big conference room, in this big pharmaceutical company's conference room, and we will try to stay at least three meters away from the people. So, and we can, we as journalists in France, we can just about go anywhere we want. Um, I believe it's the same for, and I hope it's the same for the 120 participants, that uh, freedom of the press is still guaranteed in every democracy, and that uh, journalists are allowed to leave their offices and their homes. Okay, good one. Um, I don't know who, um, maybe Adam from the BBC, um, what, or Mary, what, uh, or both, what uh, is the BBC's policy on, the, on these policies, BBC's view on the policies of risk that are entailed now in making films, given the, the health uh, circumstances? Adam, do you want to start? Um, Mary, would you like, yeah, happily. No, I mean, um, yeah, Adam's uh, doing it every day, so Adam, you, you go ahead. Um, that's kind. Um, so the BBC takes this very, very seriously um, and its practices are evolving as all our practices are. Um, essentially, as I understand it, um, you, we are allowed to make films about coronavirus, but almost all other production is halted, temporarily at least. Um, uh, we, um, it, it's a lot of the things that, that, that um, we've just heard about social distancing while filming, um, specific practices on wiping down equipment and being very careful afterwards. We've got some good practice, um, which has come out of our Beijing bureau. So obviously one advantage we have is that we are learning from the parts of the world that have experienced this, um, uh, you know, ahead of the UK. So we're learning about how our teams have worked there. Um, we take 
it very seriously. Uh, and again, that point about volunteering is another key point. Nobody goes anywhere. They don't want to go. Um, and mm -hmm. if we're hiring people who aren't staff BBC, we think through very carefully both their training, um, their awareness of those risks and their potential exposure to them and things like healthcare that's available to them in the field. So th I think the good thing is that it's not stopping us working um, because there are some really important stories that we need to go and tell. Um, but, but what we are doing is having to think through very carefully how we film, where we film and so on. So please don't think it stops things happening. It's just th th that um, risk assessment, which is an important part of lots of what we do, has become all the more important. And we're learning as we go. And I think the policies will be refined as we go. But, yes. But it's, it's, I'd say for the moment, it seems to be working well. That's not to underestimate the pressure that it puts on teams in the field, because it does put pressure in terms of PPE, in terms of just sort of physical, um, the, the physical burden of filming and so on. But um, it's not stopping us working. Great, thanks for that. I mean, uh, Sarah, you've got a team in the field at the moment, Sarah Ch Childress um, uh, from the US. Do you have anything to add there on, on risk or that you've had to deal with while you are making this current film? Yeah, we've taken very similar precautions. Um, you know, the crews that, that went out were all voluntary. Um, you know, anybody who was working on it, um, on the films, um, wearing PPE, wiping down all their equipment, staying um, at least six feet away from anybody we're interviewing using a boom mic. Um, some of the interviews we did conduct um, via Zoom or Skype um, and, um, you know, most of the folks before they went home, they quarantined themselves. You know, we had a crew in Seattle for about four weeks, so they were regularly um, you know, checking in. We were regularly checking in uh, with them, making sure that they were um, you know, comfortable with the situation they were in. Some of them left earlier, um, you know, if they felt that they were, um, you know, they no longer wanted to be in that environment. They had family at home, whatever reason. Um, so we've just, you know, worked around them and made sure that they were comfortable with, with what's happening. And, and, you know, so far everybody has emerged safely from that. Yeah. Great, thank you, and uh, look, thank you for that. Um, the the third question I want to turn to is the one of user generated content and documenting what's going on or stories or whatever on mobile phones. Um, I mean, I assume that um, as long as it's uh, good material and uh, can be is visually acceptable, that everybody here would use it. Does anyone want to comment on this, um, Claudine? Um, I know you aren't commissioning immediately, but nevertheless, what's your view uh, on using mobile phone uh, technology to, or, or taking, taking material in that has been shot on mobile phones? Well, we do it actually. <clears throat> we are documenting, we're following people during, during the crisis. And uh, <clears throat> as soon as they accept to, to participate with us, you know, they, they film some bits of, uh, things that happen in, in, in their life. And we make interviews with uh, Google Meet uh, frequently with them. And uh, they send us mobile phone uh, video. And we send a crew on field too. We do that and it works well. We respect distances and all the rules and um, for people. For people that accept to receive us, it's yeah. not a problem. Yes, it, it works well. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Qu those yeah. questions. Yeah, we have to do this because yeah, we have to work like this. I think because because we do nothing and you know. Can I yeah. Just add something, Anne? Yes, please go ahead. Um, like somebody mentioned, I think that uh, UGC now is something which is absolutely essential not only um, during that story, but in any story. And um, I think we, we should mention that the thing we have to do uh, during normal time with UGC material, that is verification, uh, check the origin, check the time, check the geolocalization, has to be done with an extreme care in these circumstances. For instance, we have received already videos uh, so-called describing a state of panic 
in the hospital in Geneva and having done the verification we have noticed that these videos were not coming from the hospital of Geneva so uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure all of my colleagues will agree that we, we will use extensively UGC these next months but we will be uh, we may be victims of falsification a lot if we don't check all yeah. this material yeah um absolutely i mean it's like everything that needs a lot of verification doesn't it yeah great yeah did you have anything you wanted to add claudine at the moment no no uh, okay of course it's, it's like any fake news or information yeah. or but uh, the video we use you know we know where it's from and you know we're aware it we, we we actually have um, a, a webinar coming up in a few weeks on verification of yes. uh, of uh, user generated content as part of it. it's part part of what it's focused on anyway but uh, some of you are already very very good at it um, we'll take one well maybe even two more rounds of questions so Eunice we have some I people are pitching ideas I believe yes uh, there have been some story ideas pitched in the chat I will kind of lifts them out now. Christina is asking anyone interested on tourism collapse in the in Portugal and the situation of Great Britain expats and Mandakini from India. Sorry, is could you asking, could you could you recap that again? Uh, the the situation the port uh, the tourism situation in Portugal. Tourism collapse in Portugal and the situation of the Great Britain expats there, GB expats. Um, I think that's oh, oh yeah expats yeah. Yes, and then okay. Mandakini from India is asking if there's any interest about stories of how national, nationalist leaders are using the crisis to fuel sectarian strife or further their nationalist goals. And do you think that this idea would work better in collaboration with colleagues from, say, Brazil and the United States instead of just focusing on one country? Next, Linda is asking if there's any interest on documentaries on the impact on children, short-term and long-term, human interest-wise, and what might this look like? Because she lives in Spain where children have been required to stay indoors for five weeks. And Maria Laura Franciosi is asking, anybody doing a story on the death of over 100 Catholic priests in Italy linked to the corona pandemic? Any stories on deaths in old people's homes wiped out by the virus in Italy? And it, apparently it's also happening in the UK. This is from Maria Laura, in, uh, an Italian journalist in Brussels. And the last one, Rowan is asking, uh, longer term pictures on subjects like domestic violence, race disparities in mortality, and abuse legislation or election laws. Do, does, do these ideas attract any interest? Right, okay. Has that, did all of you get those? Because I think um, the best way to deal with this is to go quickly round. Um, to get some responses from some of the people in the, who are commissioning. Um, yeah, Mary, do you want to start? I mean, did you have uh, a view on any of those ideas? I can repeat them, I think, if, uh, or Eunice uh, can. If right. you... I, I think I, I caught most of those. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say all those are real live issues and we're absolutely doing those every day. So the, um, huge number of deaths in care homes, both in Italy, Spain, um, Sweden, even though Sweden hasn't had that many deaths, most of the deaths that it has had are um, in um, care homes for the elderly, and in the UK as well, is, is a live issue. Um, it's been done very well by news, so I think the question would be, if it was going to be a documentary, what's, what are we adding? What are we um, revealing that the news teams won't be saying tomorrow or the next day? Um, expats in Portugal, are that's probably not one for us because we're, we broadcast to a global audience, not to a UK audience. Um, but definitely interested in um, anything that can shed light on the economic consequences long term so yeah I mean, tourism is, is you know, one of the hardest hit sectors at the moment and how quickly it comes back is of interest um, but I think we would only be interested in that if it was um, told from a, a global perspective so rather than just one, one country's um, experience and um, 
yeah, all those questions about the long-term psychological impacts. Again, that's something that's been done and discussed on a, a daily basis. Um, you know, in newspapers, radio, TV, we're certainly doing it on, on all our outlets. So again, the question is, what, if you're going to do this as a longer term project, are we actually adding to make it special and different and worthwhile doing? Um, which is not to say it's uninteresting. It is interesting, but it's just that added value question. What is it? Good, thank you for your contribution. Jean-Philippe, do you want to respond? Um, no, I can just follow up to what Maria said. I, I totally agree. I think we should focus here. Just remember, this is a uh, global investigative network and that uh, the kind of stories which have been mentioned here are basically the kind of stories we all think in our outlets uh, and we have to think about them. What we are expecting here is, as mentioned, an added value. Um, and. Uh, of course, the tourism issue, that's going to be an excellent angle for uh, any economic stories to come. Uh, the idea here is what our contributors all around the world can, uh, what kind of ideas and, and what kind of hard facts, what kind yeah. of visuals can they come with and, and add to the uh, global contribution to investigative reporting. Uh, I mean, we have to be clear. I think we, we are expecting state-of-the-art journalism and television here. Uh, this is a difficult story. And I think that the, the level of, of expectation is quite high. And this is why we need a global contribution and, and a global network, because some of these hard facts hard informations are not easy to get, um, um, as Luke mentioned, as individual outlets. Um, so yeah, all good ideas, but this is the kind of ideas we can do on ourselves. And uh, everybody has to think um, what kind of state of the art story can I, can I bring and, and how, which kind of strong story can I bring. Like I've, I've seen that some, some uh, contributors are mentioning stories from Libya. Libya is a place where it's just impossible to, to film and to shoot, and it's very difficult for, for us to go there. Um, how, how is the situation with COVID in a country in war, in Syria, in Libya? Uh, we are working on a story in Burkina Faso at the moment, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, I've, I've just heard that Médecins Sans Frontières has been allowed by the jihadists to come and help people affected with the COVID by the jihadists. I mean, this is an original story. This is a story my crew could not do. Uh, so I, I think we should focus on that kind of angles. Yes, this is another story uh, that we can maybe document together, but, but uh, it happens in Burkina Faso, it happens in Salvador, it happens in Colombia. It happens in Mexico right now that organized crime cartel group are uh, promoting, doing the propaganda instead of the government, protecting the people. And uh, Italy too, the, the, the mafia is helping and protecting the people. So what will be the, 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 the evolution of this relationship? Uh, between organized crime group and um, people that were helped by those groups. It's interesting to follow that maybe everywhere around the world. Very interesting. I think yeah. that, um, I think what the um, people, what the commissioning editors, the speakers have been saying is that um, somebody may have a completely new idea indeed, but also the, but the critical thing is to actually come up with new evidence, new facts and new evidence and facts that can actually be represented picturally or be filmed, even if it's on mobile or whatever form uh, the filming will take place. So um, it's really about um, something, something very fresh and new, new evidence basically, or as others have said, maybe new storytelling forms. Um, anybody else? else, Chris or um, uh, a Mark or Adam, anyone wish to comment or Sarah? Um, Chris? I'd just add, I mean, I 